Um, this morning, we have uh, Charlotte Ross, who is a DPhil student at St Hilda's College, but um, more than that, she has been an intern at, uh, at the library. We have a wonderful internship programme through the Careers Office, um, and you are also a reading room supervisor at the moment. Yes, newly, very newly. <laughs> so, um, this is ample qualification for <laughs> Uh, Charlotte to tell us just a little bit about uh, what she's doing for her research and to talk through a few things on the table. So over to you Charlotte. <laughs> Thanks. So as Chris said, um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit today about a project that I worked on whilst I was doing my summer internship with the Medieval Manuscripts team here. Um, and part of that work was involved with working with our Medieval Manuscripts to make them accessible to a wider online audience um, and to do that I picked very selfishly one of my favourite manuscripts which we have out here which is Fairfax 16. Fairfax is a really important and at least academically very well known anthology of 15th century medieval poetry. Um, it's got Chaucer, it's got Hockley, it's got Lydgate, it's got all the, the big names but also lots of little anonymous poems many of which are only surviving in this manuscript, so it's hugely important. Um, sorry, I just forgot my next bit. Um, so it's also one of my favorite manuscripts because it's an example of why studying the physical manuscript is really important as well as studying the text that it contains. Um, as you can see, it's a huge volume and as expected, there are a couple of scribal errors in it which really shows a lot about how anthologies of this size were compiled and what people really valued in these books. So I'll tell you about my two favorite examples quickly just to show you what I mean. Um, the first one I have open here in the facsimile version of the manuscript and it's Thomas Hockley's Letter of Cupid. Now at some point in the manuscript's life, the choir that this poem is in was accidentally shuffled. So the stanzas are now in completely the wrong order. And on top of that, the central bifolium was taken out and folded back on itself. So in a linear sense, it makes complete, it doesn't make any sense, it's complete nonsense. But readers didn't particularly seem to notice or care. And that tells us a lot and it invites us to think a lot about what, what linearity meant in terms of this poem, how it was received in this specific unique context how the physical book in this sense is shaping the way that this poem was received and does the fact that it's that we think it's in the wrong order actually matter turns out to the fairfax audience not really another great example of um, why looking at the actual book is important is uh, lydgate's reason and sensuality which is the longest text in this manuscript um, and this is the only surviving um, copy of this text it was copied from this manuscript into another one, but this is, this is all that we've got. And tragically, it's incomplete. It just ends at the bottom of the page and it cuts off and there is no more. Now following it are 11 blank but frame ruled pages, which suggests that the scribe at least expected to find the rest of the poem, but never did. But what's even more interesting is that in the over 500 years since, no one else has repurposed these pages. So almost as if everyone kept expecting to find the rest of this lost poem. And it's really rare to find a huge chunk of 11 pages just left in a manuscript. This is free real estate. It's weird that you wouldn't use it up. But because of that, um, the sort of emptiness has become a really important part of how people read the text. You sort of get to the end and there's this expanse of nothingness. And the Fairfax audience obviously thought that was fitting. This is in fact a dream vision poem. So thematically and literary speaking, it fits quite well. The printed edition just has a little note saying poem incomplete. But when you look at it in this form, you can see that it's clearly unintentionally incomplete and moreover that the incompleteness is actually quite an important part of the manuscript. So it's definitely one that's worth looking at as well as reading. In terms of accessibility, um, from an academic standpoint, the volume's doing quite well. We have this great facsimile, we have a really good um, uh, digital um, catalogue description, and as of this summer, it has been fully digitised. So 
lots and lots of resources. And these are really only used by quite a narrow audience, specifically students and researchers. And although the digital facsimile is wonderful, it's also 721 images long, which can be quite difficult to, to work your way through and certainly to peruse at leisure. So during my internship, I worked on the different ways that we could make this manuscript accessible and appealing to a wider range of perhaps more casual audiences. The first thing I did was I wrote a Wikipedia page about it, which is under review. Um, and whilst it's not the most academic resource, I was able to use that to write in a more opinionated way than the catalogue is allowed to, why this is important, why it matters, why it's interesting. It has a rundown of some of some but not all of the contents, so it's much easier to look at than the catalogue that has absolutely everything. Um, it has a short history of um, the ownership and the conservation and just like the little fun facts. And once that's been published, A, it will make it more searchable, it will be the second thing that comes up on Google after our catalogue, but also it will link to loads of other Wikipedia pages about Chaucer and Fairfax and it will just make it much more findable for a casual reader. But I also worked with a software called Exhibit, which some of you might be familiar with. And it's a really cool piece of software that allows you to make a sort of guided tour of a digital facsimile. So it works by allowing you to select different pages or even different sections of a page and to write a little commentary that goes alongside it. That can be a little note of why this is important, or it can be a transcription of a particular bit of text but it's a really great way of allowing you to skip through pages of the facsimile, which is really helpful when it is over 700 images long, because in part it means that you can skip right the way to the end, which I probably won't reach in time, um, to look at, for example, the binding, which you can see over there, which at the moment is housed in the, um, the box as the manuscript was rebound. But on the digital facsimile, it's image 711, so I can almost guarantee no one ever makes it that far. But with this, you can just skip through to it pretty quickly and it will tell you all about the conservation and how it was rebound and the fact that they have the original wooden boards and things like that. Um, which is information that at the moment is only in the printed conservation report held downstairs um, in the gallery. So yeah, I, I just think Exhibit is a really cool bit of, um, bit of software. I think it has loads of potential for, um, for writing sort of more informal guided tours to these manuscripts and really making the most out of our digital facsimiles that so many people have put so much work into, but also potentially an avenue that we could explore for making these manuscripts accessible and interesting to perhaps a, a more casual readership. Feel free to come and have a flick through it. <laughs> Thank you, Shaka. I've just got a question. So you you, you took the images from our digital dot Bodleian yeah. uh, publicly accessible site, and then you used Exhibit to annotate in this way. Yeah. And who gets to see this version with the, the glosses and annotations? And is, is that something that can be integrated with digital dot Bodleian or how does it work? Yeah, so I was, I've been talking with um, Matthew and Andrew about where would be the best place to put this because we did talk about, uh, it is basically accessible through a link. It's not password protected or anything like that. So as long as you have the link, you can access it. Um, we did talk about putting it on the digital catalog, but then we thought people would have to want to read the catalog, get to the bottom of it, to then find the links. That might not be the most profitable way. Um, it's probably something we'll put up on the Wikipedia page once that has been published. And also we were thinking maybe a blog post, which might be more findable. Um, it might also be worth adding to the catalog if it's something that maybe students would find useful. If they've been told to go and look at the manuscript for a class, it would be a really quick way of getting to grips with what it is. Um, but yeah, it's because it is just a link and it's not password protected, you can, you can sort of put it anywhere. And I suppose just this general question of uh, public being able to annotate things and how, how, where do you set the, the sort of editorial control or the quality control? On... That's a good question. Um, so Exhibit is a public and free software. I just had to create an account. I didn't have to be affiliated. However, it is 
where the link is included is where you have the control of who is making sort of public comments on these. So it might be something that if this gains enough traction that we can open it up to the public and say, feel free, if this is a manuscript that you've worked on, feel free to write your own guide, send it to us and we'll collaborate, make sure it's up to sort of Bodleian standards and then maybe post it as a collaborative work. Um, there's nothing to stop anyone from making their own mm -hmm. Um, commentary and it you know it might even be like a good study resource for students um, if they have specific history of a book um, exams coming up or something like that but in terms of publishing the link I think yeah it's uh, we, we control what gets published and therefore yeah that's sort of the control okay well I'm sure people have other questions to ask you and we'll take a closer look but thank you very much